Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manesh. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We have a great guest all the way from San Francisco, California. Welcome to the show, Nicholas Henriksen. Victor, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Now, Nicholas, you've been an entrepreneur for much of your life. Uh, you didn't grow up here in the U.S. or in North America. Maybe why don't you give us a little bit of your backstory and how you got to this point in your journey? Sure. So I was born and raised in Germany originally, and I moved to the U.S. in 2011. Before moving, I used to play on the German golf national team. So there was a time when I thought I'll become a professional golf player, but instead I went to college, studied computer science and finance, and then I came to the U.S. to pursue my MBA at Stanford. And then after Stanford, after graduating from Stanford, I started my first company. I love that. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. I had an office in Sunnyvale where I ran a microprocessor development team. And there's something about the Silicon Valley culture that's infectious when it comes to entrepreneurship. You're surrounded by people that are, you know, almost believe it's their God-given right to start a business, even if that isn't necessarily the the (laughs) best thing to do. Everyone wants to do a startup. And so you definitely spent some formative years in that environment. What was the result of being just immersed in that environment? Yeah, so fast forward, I started a company, we raised $10 million, we sold it to Carvana, that's the company with the car vending machines. Um, And the the whole journey took four years. And it's funny that you mentioned that there's something special about like the area and and the mindset and the vibe here. Because when I tell you in a second how the whole business started, you'll laugh and you'll be like, yeah, only in Silicon Valley. Absolutely. I mean, there's just so many stories of people, you know, the, the, the two guys in a garage story, you think about it as, you know, Hewlett Packard or Apple, but it's a story that repeats itself all over the valley. Correct. So in, in our case, we were actually working out of my now second time co-founder's uh, living room. He's a huge car enthusiast. We helped our classmates sell cars. We thought there's a better way to create a marketplace between two individuals. We sold a bunch of our classmates cars and without even thinking about making it a business. It was just what we did over the summer. And when I talked to one of our professors about career planning after business school, after an hour, he said, I need to go, but I like what you guys are doing. I think you should be selling cars. And if you want to make this a business, here's $50,000 to get started. I love that. You know, it's interesting. A friend of mine wanted to, uh, you probably heard of the name Jay Abraham, who's I have. A, a legend when it comes to business turnarounds and putting together partnership deals and all kinds of things like that. A buddy of mine did a deal with Jay Abraham. He said, if you if you coach me, I have a, a business that basically sells and restores muscle cars. Oh, wow. He said, every three months, I'll deliver you a new car for you to drive for three months <laughs> if you will mentor me. And that was the deal I put together. He just tapped into something that Jay Abraham loved, one of his passions, yeah. uh, and uh, it was a win-win relationship. Yeah. I think that happens a lot in business where money is not the most valuable currency. In in Silicon Valley, it's often equity. So we had a lot of employees who took a very, very low salary uh, against equity so they can participate in the upside. The same is true for professors and lecturers and angels, um, advisors. And and, and in your example, it was cars. These cars were just more valuable to that person than the money it would have taken to buy or rent them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not that Jay Abraham doesn't have the money. If he wanted to go rent or buy any of those vehicles, he could. He certainly earned enough yeah. money in his lifetime to, to to buy an entire fleet. But it was the intriguing approach that uh, just sealed the deal. I think this is, this is so true in startups generally. You, you need to think outside of the box, do things that don't scale, um, and be, be resourceful and creative around how you solve problems. Because the most important thing is really to get started. Like a lot of friends of mine who wanted to start businesses, they, they basically thought themselves out of, out of starting it. They put so much thought into thinking through everything that could go wrong and all the corner cases, everything, all the stars that need to align for this to work. And they ended up with a place where like, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. And so I think that's a risk for every founder. I'm a big believer in the fundamentals. And the, to me, that means, number one, it's got to solve a genuine problem. And I make a distinction between selling vitamins versus pain medication. I want to sell pain medication because in that situation, there's an acute need and the customer is willing to buy right now. So number one, it's got to solve a real problem. And it's got to be an important enough problem that people are willing to spend money to solve it right now. Yep. If you have those ingredients, I think you have the makings of a business. If you're thinking of, well, I'm going to make 
you know, this color paint a little shinier or, you know, something that's really in that vitamins category that's highly discretionary, it's uh, it's not a sustainable business. That's true. The, the risky part of the second one is you can you can cheat yourself by thinking into you have a painkiller because you can pay for marketing, you can give away uh, 70 cents for a dollar or you... Like there's a lot of ways how you artificially grow your company and it looks from the outside as if, oh, this is going well. Uh, and a lot of startups make that mistakes. They must make that mistake. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. It needs to be something that people can't get anywhere else. It needs to be such a great customer experience that they tell friends. So word of mouth needs to be really strong. And when you have that, we call it product market fit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm also a believer in the work of, uh, of Eric Reese, uh, the lean startup. I mean, yep. that's been one of the seminal books in the world of entrepreneurship. And in that book, he talks about something called the MVP, the minimum viable right. product. And that's really the product that you need to establish to test market whether the market that you postulate is there is really there. Yep. So you don't need to build the whole thing with all the bells and whistles, you've just got to have something that solves enough of the problem that customers are willing to pay money, really to test market whether the product or the idea is viable. Yeah, exactly. We always say, my co-founder, I always say, if we're not embarrassed about what we put in front of customers, we waited too long. And it's the same notion of you just really need to validate few hypotheses. Is there fundamental value? Yes or no. And you don't need to polish the product too much. That's then the later stage for the late adopters. But for the early adopters, you just need to solve a problem. So we often talk about wanting to deliver products that have integrity, products that are complete, that have high quality. And what you're describing is something that's a process that's a little bit more chaotic. Yep. And and yet, that is the path to success for most startup companies. Yeah, I think integrity means very different things for very different people. So for the mass market and the consumer who's not very tech savvy, integrity and fully functional product means buck free, no problem, very easy to use, super intuitive. But for an early adopter, just finding that somebody is addressing a problem that he or she had run into multiple times and once solved, that already is a lot of integ integrity and that creates that excitement in the early adopters. The early adopters are usually people who are excited about being the first one to find a product and not the first ones to use the perfect version of the product. One definition I've heard of the word integrity, you know, we often think of integrity as like you just like you described it's honesty it's perfection it's it's all of those things but if you think about say a bicycle wheel yep. and if some of the spokes are missing or the wheel is bent you remove enough of the spokes and all of a sudden the wheel lacks integrity it no longer functions as a wheel because yep. it, it collapses but if you straighten a few of the spokes and as long as you have enough of the spokes in place it doesn't have to be perfect the wheel still has integrity and i like yep. that definition of integrity when it comes, it's really, it's all about workability more so than perfection. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. It's, you wouldn't sit your grandma on a bike with like a uh, not perfect wheel because it shakes and there's a risk that you fall off, but you would certainly do it with somebody who's eager and excited to try your product and give you feedback. And so the, the audience of people who are willing to try early stage products, because all they care about is a so solution to the problem is really big. Usually I agree with you. So from the world of entrepreneurship, from the world of tech startups into the world of real estate investing, where's the journey? Good question. So we sold our business in 2017 and all of a sudden I went from paying myself minimum wage to having a little bit of capital on my side. And so having capital is, is a blessing in disguise uh, or or the other way around. Or a curse, because it's easier to spend your own money than it is to, to raise capital with all the scrutiny That's true. that that process entails. And so, yeah, you're, you're, you're risk to do dumb things. In, in my case, I, I learned the lesson from my professors and advisors. Don't, you either commit your time or your money to a startup, not both. And so I needed to figure out a way how to diversify my, my portfolio, basically, how to invest my capital. And so at first I put it in the market and then I realized that I couldn't sleep properly seeing like the money go up and down. I got really emotional around this, this roller coaster ride of public markets. Um, and the biggest risk in public markets is that you do something that's irrational and impatient. And so that's how I then took the money out of the market and asked myself, what are assets that fundamentally have a value that are more long term, a little less liquid 
And so I, that's how I stumbled into real estate. Two friends of mine who were basically flipping houses um, were doing really great work and asked them whether I can invest in their projects. And so ever since we've been, we've been flipping five or six projects and these guys have gotten really good at it. And for me, it's a, it's a way to invest so I can sleep at night and don't need to worry about it uh, because I, I run the risk with my time, but not with my, my money, if that makes sense. Back when I was a an officer of a U.S. public company, this would have been early to mid two thousands, and I listened to our CEO at the time go on Jim Cramer's TV show and literally lie to the American public. Uh, he, you know, he said outrageous things. You know, he said things like "I dare you not to buy my stock" and things like that. And at that point, I said, "Oh my goodness." Here, all these poor investors, the CEO of the company is not being straight with them. And how many other companies, how many other boardrooms in America is that happening? Is this the only one? Clearly, the answer is no. So at that point, I realized that the small investor in the public markets has no control. They literally have no control. And I made the decision at that time. And I grew up, by the way, in the world of stocks and bonds. My uncle owned a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. So I came from that world. And today, I hold zero stock in public companies uh, because you have no control. I agree with that. I fully agree with that. Warren Buffett says something interesting. He says that the stock market is a tool for him to move in and out of companies, but it doesn't it doesn't actually tell him the value of his companies. He 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 determines the fundamental value of his companies independently, and so when he makes makes moves and invests, he he basically wants control. Like the investments he makes are so big that he can exercise a large degree of control. Knows the management really well and. And it's a very different game than as if I or, or you or other individuals deploy some of their savings in public markets. I 100% agree with you, Victor. I love that. I love the wisdom of what you said a few moments ago, invest your time or your money, but not both at the same time. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah. So like everybody knows the saying, don't, don't put all your eggs into one basket. And that's a little bit what you do if you invest your own money in your own company. When you're taking a risk and starting your own company, you should raise venture funding. You can start out with angel investors who believe more in you than anything else. Then when you get to a seat stage, you actually have an MVP, as we talked about earlier. Then you can attract like seat funding from institutional seat funds who are in the business of deploying capital. The big difference between these people and you is that you're committing 100% of your time into one project. But all these seed investors have wide portfolios. They invest in literally dozens, if not hundreds of companies over a period of a couple of years. And so it only works. Startup investing only works if you have a portfolio. You can't make these singular bets. Yet if you start your own company, you're basically already making a singular bet with your time. So you, you must not, I highly recommend not putting your own money into your own startup. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. I mean, certainly in the world of startups and certainly tech startups or um, biotech startups, the success rate, the hit rate that we speak about traditionally in the industry is about 10%. So you can often expect uh, in a tech startup that 80 or 90% are going to go to zero or at least some percentage are going to be the walking dead where maybe you'll get your money back. But it's only going to be in that single digits that actually deliver the 10x, 20x, 30x returns. And it's that one in 10 that makes up for all the other nine that don't make it. Exactly. Yeah. This is this is the nature of what you're doing. That's why it's fun. You want to be the one, <laughs> one out of 10 that works, but uh, you need to make sure that you're not nine out of the 10. Um, the, the good news is, and this is very different than what I knew from Germany in, in the Bay, and you mentioned it earlier, in the Bay Area, taking risk is highly encouraged. So people who run a company and it doesn't work, the same investors will approach and tell you, hey, let's do it again. Do you have another idea? I would love to be an investor. That's very different in the Bay Area than in Germany. In Germany, there's a stigma around failing. Uh, which is part of the reason why I wanted to move to the yes, because like if, if you're allowed to fail, you take bigger risks. If you take bigger risks, the outcomes and innovation can just be like much, much bigger and interesting. I love that. Okay, so contrast that in the world of technology startups with the world of real estate, where you really want your successes to be 99% of the time. You, you're really looking for that very solid, stable, predictable outcome. How are those two worlds compatible? Are they, uh, or How do they intersect, if at all? Yeah, the intersection is little because of what I invest in are these real estate flips where like it's an entrepreneurial activity and a little venture to flip a house. You actually need to create value. 
you're not investing in intangibles. Like at any given time when we flip the house, there's a house, there's a custom material. And for as long as you know the contractor and you know that he does a good job, the, the cost of the house and the money that you put in is not going to disappear into hot air, which it is in a startup because you're paying salaries, you're paying software developers. And so when I invest in real estate, I, I, the, the one thing I care about most is downside protection. So I must not lose money. And how do I do that is I, I have an, like a deed of trust. I have a lien. I figure out what is the land worth. Like I figure out these bits and pieces and what is the sum of the parts. And for as long as the sum of the parts is worth what I'm investing, I feel really good because I feel like my downside is protected. And in startups, it's the opposite. Like the parts are hot air. You're, the parts is code. Um, and so what you need to do is you, you need to invest into into value propositions, put them in front of customers, iterate really quickly. And at the end of the day, if everybody stops working at some point and the software isn't finished, then there's nothing, there's literally nothing left. Uh, and so that's why the intersection between real estate and startup investing is relatively little. And that's by design and choice. That's exactly what I want. I don't want to run any risk with my capital or I don't want to run the risk of losing everything. I want it to be protected and I want there to be an upside. If everything turns out. And if it doesn't turn out, if I just get my money back, I'm happy to. You know, there's a tremendous amount of wisdom in that because, you know, when we talk about investing, you want to put your money in a couple of different buckets. You want to put a portion of it in the security bucket and you want to put a portion of it in, in, let's say that dream bucket. You know, if you think about a baseball team, if you had a baseball team that only swung for the fences every time, they never hit a single, they never hit a bunt, they never hit a double, they only went for home runs, they would lose every game. It would absolutely lose every game. So you need singles and doubles and triples and home runs in order to have a successful baseball team and likewise a successful business. Yeah, that's why I like the money, the movie Moneyball so much because I think it does a good, good, it does a good job at explaining how even even a baseball team is a portfolio and you need to be really smart around allocation and and if you allocate the team wisely then people with individual weaknesses in a portfolio actually have a lot of strength. Um, and so it's, it's all about diversification in some way. Fantastic. Well, Nicholas, I love the investing philosophy. If folks want to learn more, if they want to get in touch, what's the best way? The best way is to connect, be, connect with me over LinkedIn. That's how we met, Victor. Just look for Nicholas Hendricks and maybe you can put a, put a link in the show notes. Love to connect, love to get feedback on what people are up to. If, if people want to run businesses by me, I'm investing myself. I'd love to take a look. If people just want to have advice or get thoughts, I, a lot of people help me on my journey. And so if, if, if I can give back and, and, and help other people, that would be a pleasure for me. Well, fantastic. So definitely reach out to Nicholas at Nicholas Henriksen on LinkedIn, and that's spelled H-I-N-R-I-C-H-S-E-N. And for the listeners at home, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow.